Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're continuing our Total War Three Kingdoms multiplayer unit tier list with the blue units in the game. As always, we'll be doing an overview for all these units from the cheapest to the most expensive in terms of their custom multiplayer recruitment costs. But before we jump into that, we need to clarify the role that blue units or range unit have in your army. And be mindful that when we speak of blue units, there are actually three different types. First, we have the range infantry, which have the most units per retinue, and thus the highest damage potential. But they're not mobile. Thus, for them to reach that high damage potential, you must commit other resources in terms of units to protect them and make sure your micro is also on point so they can hit the right targets. Then aside from the infantry variety, there are the range cavalry units, which are usually only one quarter the size of the infantry retinue and thus have less total damage potential but their high mobility and relatively high melee charge bonus can make them a dual threat on the battlefield, as they can constantly pressure the enemy armies through harassment and hit and run tactics. Lastly, there are the three siege weapons, which are the least mobile units in the game. While they also have potential for high damage, convincing a human player to charge at your siege weapons is almost an impossible task. So unless you're playing a siege battle, or have means to immobilize your opponents, it is very hard to see how siege weapons can be an effective tool in multiplayer, especially with their steep recruitment cost. And now that we have introduced all three types of blue unit, let's get this overview started, starting with the peasant archers, which is also the cheapest unit in multiplayer at only 145 cost. So looking at these units, they are first off expendable, which is actually a wonderful trait to have. But in terms of their damage output, it's the same tier as the Archer Militia. These belong to the Yellow Turban DLC characters, which are the original Yellow Turban characters before the Mandate of Heaven DLC came out. You have 180 range, 22 base damage, 6 armor piercing, pretty much the same stats as the Archer Militia right next to it, but they're a lot cheaper. They're also worthless in melee. It has a lower attack rate in melee, as well as lower ammo count compared to the Archer Militia, but because you're paying much less for it, uh, it is going to get away with these stat deficiencies. And in terms of arrow types, if you have the proper generals in your army, you can get both poison and fire arrows on them. And their value really just comes from the fact that you can shoot out perhaps fire arrows to hurt the enemy morale. They'll get hit with under fire as well as on fire, two different concepts for morale hits. In combat, they're obviously as worthless as any other archer units that's lower tier because once you run into them with their low morale, they're just going to rout completely. But thankfully, because these are expendable, they're actually usable because they wouldn't hurt your other units morale uh, since they would just ignore expendable units routing. Then moving on to archer militia, we have a very similar unit, almost the same stats, but it does have higher attack rate as well as slightly higher morale. Uh, it has the same exact damage output for range as well, but more ammo, essentially. Uh, same issues. It's really fragile in terms of morale as well as health and combat capabilities. You can use it to use the fire arrows, but in essence, you probably wouldn't want to recruit these units because once they route, they could become a negative factor for the rest of your army. You want to go a little bit more premium in multiplayer. Then moving up to a slightly better unit, we are now using a real bow. Uh, 200 range with higher damage, 25, 8, uh, nigh attack rate, 25 ammo. The melee stats still terrible. As a matter of fact, for yellow turban archers, the melee attack rates lower than archer militia. You have lower morale as well, and you cost a bit more. So for this unit, it's more about the extra range damage with the better bow with more range. I still wouldn't favor it for a lot of these infantry variants of the archer units. I don't think they're viable for multiplayer because they're extremely fragile. Uh, if you don't micro them, they are essentially one general charge away from routing and you get no value out of them. If the enemy don't target these, that's the enemy's fault. But in essence, if someone wanted to take out your archers before they get to shoot their arrows, they definitely can. And there's not much you can do to protect them, especially with generals charging out at them and just roaring and then running away. What can you really do in that situation? Then for Naman Slingers, we have another expendable unit for the Naman faction, but unlike the archery units we've seen so far, it has much less range 
and it doesn't have the capability of using fire or poison arrows, which makes their value a lot weaker, even though their range damage is closer to that of the more upgraded bow with a 25 base and 5 armor piercing. They have much faster attack rate and much more ammo because they're throwing little rocks essentially. Their melee capability is also a bit higher, but like I said, uh, the issue with these unit is extremely low range and you don't get the value out of the range because most of the archers that we have seen so far give value when they shoot a fire arrow that can reduce the enemy morale by close to 10 points with both the fire as well as the under range attack or under fire uh, status on the morale. Here you're getting none of that. So I don't think these units are worth it at all, even though they also carry the expendable tag. Then moving on to the 325 to 350 cost range, we have the standard archer. Uh, this unit would look just like the yellow turban archer we saw earlier, except for it costs a little bit more and the melee is still very poor. You do have better armor now. The bow is the same exact bow with more ammo. Overall, my opinion on these are the same. You don't really want these units in your army. Then crossbow. Now crossbow units are a bit different than archer units. They have much higher armor piercing damage. They fire a lot slower. They don't carry as much ammo, but they do have better range. Now I do tolerate crossbow units a bit more in multiplayer because the armor piercing damage is going to be much more effective since most people are going to be running more elite units. Thus, the higher armor piercing damage is actually going to do real damage to the opponent you don't get the morale component with the fire arrow or poison arrow, but overall, the armor piercing damage could help you. Although I still think if the enemy commits a general at your range units and one smash, one roar, this unit is just going to rout. It's not going to be useful. You're not going to get to fire any of your ammo at the enemy, and it's just going to be a waste of money in multiplayer. Then we have the repeating crossbowmen. These have much shorter range, only armor base damage, but... Each volley has five to six arrows, I believe. So it's 21 times five to six if you want to do the calculation. So they actually have a fair bit of damage. Unfortunately, because of the short range, because they're sort of a crossbow units where you can't put fire on the arrows, and also because it's all base damage and multiplayer, they're actually going to do a lot worse. In campaign, they're actually usable because they're very good counters to light shock cavalry. One volley would actually kill off pretty much all the shock cavalries in the game. And then we have the Proachers, which is a Yellow Turban Zhang Brothers unique unit. So they're more the Mandate of Heaven, uh, Zhang Jiao, Zhang Bao, Zhang Liang uh, unit. It has sort of the same damage output as the regular Archer. So there's really nothing to see here. And melee capability is slightly higher. And we have both Fire and Poison Arrow available. But I still don't think it's a great unit for the same reasons we have been covering. And also at this price range, it actually has quite low of a morale. So that makes it an even worse option here. Then jumping a little bit ahead, we have 400 to 425 costs. We have Archer Defector, once again, another John Brothers Yellow Turban unit. Compared to the Procher, I think this is actually a worse unit. It has slightly higher morale, but worse melee capabilities with the same exact range output, but costs more. So I don't know how this unit is better. Then we have the Bandit Hunters. This is the Bandit base variant of the range units. It's basically their version of the Archer at 405 cost it's pretty much the same unit. Most archers, we just have to look at their range damage and they all have the 200 range bow that does 25 and eight. So not really much to see here. Then we have the Wuling Slingers. These are the slightly upgraded variant of the Slinger. It actually has the same damage as the standard Slinger and I think worse melee capabilities because more of this damage is on base, whereas the regular Slinger had it on armor piercing and the regular Slinger had expendable, whereas this unit does not. So it's actually worse in my opinion. And then we have the Archer Gang, which is a Zhang Bao, Zhang Liang, unique Archer unit. Uh, it's not very good. It's the same exact unit as the Archer Defector. You're paying 25 more to get a bit more armor and actually a bit more health. Because if you notice, after the 400 cost here, all the units have 45k health. All the units before only had 40k health. So about a 12% boost to the health of all units in the retinue. But overall, it's still a terrible unit. Then moving up to the 450 to 460 cost range, we have the Mercenary Archers. Now these are pretty great in the campaign because they come mustered, they actually have a better bow, but unfortunately they suffer from extremely low morale. And that's going to be a big issue in multiplayer. And their instant mustering capability becomes really a moot point for multiplayer as well. 
And then moving past them, we have the Chang Archers. They go back to the regular Archer damage, 25 and 8, so that makes them worse. And you don't have much morale to work with here either. Then finally, we have the E Archers. They have the upgraded bow, similar to the Mercenary Archer. Their damage is not as good as the Mercenary Archer because most of their damage is in base. They do have higher evasion, so they're probably better in melee just because they have the higher evasion and also they have much better morale. That's really what's the better point here for the unit comparison. Um, the range component is pretty much the same. Then for heavy crossbow, they're the same thing as the regular crossbow with a bit more health, a bit more morale, and a lot more armor. And you're paying a bit more for them, and that's essentially the difference. Then for the White Tiger Raiders, so these are Yan Bai Hu faction unique, so they're available on Yan Bai Hu and Yan Yu, and they're going to be decent for two reasons. So first, if they're recruited on Yan Bai Hu, a pretty high chance of that happening, they're going to have stock. Then on top of having stock, they also are a dual weapon user, so they have the melee capability of a spear guard unit in terms of damage output, and they're also carrying a spear. And on top of carrying a spear, they also have access to shield wall, so you can have invisible shield wall set up on the field where you can try to lure the enemy units to run into you, whether it's cavalry or generals to try to dismount them. And they also have a decent range block chance at 60% because they're really just a sort of a spear guard archer hybrid that's mainly an archer, but they have a lot of the qualities of the spear guard. So that makes them actually quite interesting. Now, the bow damage isn't very high, it's the same as archer, and the morale is not very high, so those are disappointing parts. But overall, quite an interesting unit given that they can easily gain access to stock. Then moving up to the 475 to 525 cost tier, we have the territorial archers, which is only unique to Tao Tian. Now these units, if they're on defense, will gain some extra stats. 10% extra damage for both armor piercing and base, 10 points of morale, and 10% melee evasion. Now of course you could set up the match where you are always on the defending side if you're hosting the room for multiplayer. Most players won't mind that. But even with these added stats, the unit doesn't look that great. 10% of 25 is 27.5, 10% of 8 is 8.8. .8. You're literally getting about 3 point, you know, five damage added to your total damage composition. The 10% melee evasion does make you survive longer, but you don't really have melee attack capability. So if you're caught in melee, you're not going to return any damage. You're just going to get killed slower. And the 10 points morale does make it a bit better, but at this cost level, a lot of units do have higher morale. So 33 is not really going to make or break uh, your unit either. And if you end up not being on the defensive side, then the unit is just bad. And then we have the heavy repeating crossbowmen, same bow, higher health, higher armor, very similar to the heavy crossbowmen situation. And then we have the fire archer. Now this is a Nanman unit. Now this unit's actually pretty interesting because they have a default fire arrow. You cannot change it. And their damage is very different too. Whereas a regular fire arrow has very low damage with most damage on the fire damage component, if you look at your regular archers and you switch them to a fire arrow, their damage is going to drop a lot. Here, you actually retain quite high damage. Now, of course, most of that is on base damage, 45, but that's still very high. And you have three armor pieces to go with that. So that makes it pretty interesting. Of course, this unit is only really going to get value from the fire component and nothing else, but it does make it probably the highest damaging fire arrow user in the game because it has good damage on the arrow itself, plus the fire damage that you will cause afterward as well. So that makes it slightly more interesting. Then we have the Yao Guai Hunters, which is the invisible poison archers that Zhang Bao use, and they've been nerfed quite a bit after their launch. They were kind of insane on launch. Uh, as you can see here, we have an archer that has just poison arrows, and their damage is actually weak reflecting how poison arrows would impact your range damage, whereas the fire archers we just talked about actually retained very high damage, so it's very strange. So these are, in comparison, much worse. Uh, they also have less morale, uh, way less actually, and having stock doesn't really help you in multiplayer for a range unit because the instant you shoot off your first volley, they know exactly where you are, even if you have snipe. Uh, they will just see those green arrows fly in the sky, and then they will go find you. And once they find you, you're pretty much dead. 2% melee evasion, 20% armor, 18 morale, 
with almost no combat capabilities with five base damage and night armor piercing. They're just a much more interesting campaign unit than a multiplayer unit in my opinion. Especially since this unit would also force you to pick Zhang Bao for your general. Then as we move into the 530 to 575 cost range, we have another pretty niche yellow turban unit. These are for the regular yellow turban DLC veteran units. We have Men of the Forest. And these units, uh, they carry an axe with them, so their melee capability is a little bit higher. Their range capability actually is just that of an archer, uh, not high morale either. So I don't really view these units as very strong. Then we have the Dong Zhou Bing Marksman. Uh, this is one of the Dong Zhou Bing variants unique to Liu Zhang, Liu Yan, and Fa Zheng. Uh, they have high damage, they're using a better bow, 40 and 10 damage bow. And their melee capability is just the same as the Archer Militia, which is quite sad. 30 morale makes them barely usable. Uh, they do have better melee defense stats, 30 evasion and 25 armor. But overall, I don't rate them very highly. Uh, they're not very flexible compared to their Dong Zhou Bing Spearman variant, which has the bow plus the spears. And then we have Sanjiang Poison Dart users. Uh, this is a Nanman unit. They have obviously poison damage on their blow darts, and that's reflected by only 5 base damage because most of the damage will come from the poison itself. Only 60 range, that's the problem. And poison's not that strong. They're better in melee with 15 base, but still, with only 2 armor piercing, it's not really a lot of stats. And their morale is still very low at below 30 at 550 cost, so I don't think these units are very good either. Then land Trozen. Uh, this is... Once again, another yellow turban variant of a uh, range unit. These are available for pretty much all veterans from both yellow turban DLC variants. And they have more range at 225. Uh, in campaign, this is great because you want to outshoot the enemy archers. In multiplayer, more range gives you more time to shoot before the enemy gets close to you. But oftentimes, the enemy is coming from behind you or from different angles than coming straight at you and you're really not going to get into a shooting duel with enemy range units or at least i hope not and in that case i don't think this unit is very good in campaign they're not bad because of this extra range even though it takes a little bit of damage off what's usually a 40 10 uh, bow but you also have better melee stats for this unit as well but all those are kind of moot points for a multiplayer then officially moving to the 600 cost, we have the Archer of Jing, which is Sima Ai's unique unit. Uh, they can fire while moving. They're pretty much a clone of the E Archers, actually, with a different name. So you can just kind of consider them as that. In campaign, they have great combat capability as well with 28 and I damage with 30 attack speed. 30 morale is usable. Uh, the main issue with this is they're only available on Sima Ai, which is an 8 princess general who's not super good. So I wouldn't really consider these as viable options. Just go with a cheaper E Marksman if you want to get some similar stats. Then we have Fury of Beihai, probably one of the best range crossbow units in the game. 250 range with insane crossbow damage, and they have decent melee capability, just a bit weak in terms of armor because they're sort of the light variant. There's a more expensive uh, Thunder of Jian An, which is sort of a heavy variant. I think these are may be viable in multiplayer just because you have such high range and high armor piercing damage and we already mentioned what armor piercing damage can do so these are interesting and then we have the T crossbowman uh, which is a unique eight princess unit again for Sima uh, these if you look at the stats it's closer to a regular crossbow unit with the 220 range 1842 damage split they're just heavily armored so essentially this is a uh, heavy crossbowman. Uh, that's how you should see it. And it costs more than heavy crossbowman because you're getting more morale and more health at 49k, which is a very weird number. And then we have Watchmen of the Peace. These are, once again, back to Yellow Turban veteran units. They carry a big shield. So in campaign, they're pretty good frontline units against enemy range. They have more range. So they sort of counter other range units by outranging them and being able to block their arrow. Uh, in terms of damage, they are, once again, just a crossbow unit with better melee capabilities and much better defensive stat thanks to the bow. So these are great in campaign, in my opinion. I don't think they're that good in multiplayer because you don't really need the range defense component. People don't tend to shoot each other with range units in multiplayer. And finally, we have a javelin thrower. Now, these are actually quite interesting. So first off, they have 49k health 
which is an interesting number once again, as we see on the T crossbowmen. They have decent melee capabilities. Most of it's base damage, I know, but still a very high number. They have decent defensive stats in terms of their shield and melee capability if they do get into a melee fight. And most of all, they have extremely high armor piercing damage at very low range with very low ammo. I do realize that. But they also have access to formations where they can put themselves into a shield wall because javelins are basically miniature spears. So you're basically a spear unit that throw very high armor piercing damage and you can become a protection unit for your other more vulnerable units against enemy generals that I've been mentioning that could charge at you because these armor piercing damage hurt. You have 120 guys throwing spears that does at least 50 armor piercing damage and plus I'm guessing let's say average 50% armor. So 10 damage go through from the base part. You're hitting for 60 damage per unit. Uh, of course, not 120 uh, you know, arrows will, or javelins will hit, but still, that's a significant amount of damage. If, say, half of them hit, you're about 3.6k you know, health gone for a general. That hurts. So you can actually help protect a lot of your formation with these units. The only thing you have to micro about them is the way they're facing with their shield wall and also kind of uh, when you want to have fire will on because you don't really want to waste these javelins on you know pointless units you want to target high priority targets whether that's generals or whether that's cavalry units um, just basically be mindful of who you're shooting at uh, but overall a very interesting unit for this price range actually uh, i would consider them pretty high quality then moving up to the 700 to 800 cost range, we have Bringers of Righteousness. Uh, this is, once again, a yellow turban unit, and this one is going to be available only on Heiyi. It has insane melee capabilities for range units. Uh, I think it also uses a glaive, so it does better against cavalry as well. Sadly, it doesn't have formations, or else these units might actually be viable. Uh, but in terms of damage output, their damage is actually just a regular archer. That's a bit disappointing. But like I said, their selling point is that they have good melee damage. Then we have the Ye Vanguard Crossbowmen. Now these units, like their uh, spear variety cousins, have the square formation. And that's actually really valuable because now you have a range unit that can shoot 360 degrees. Now you might be asking, what is that going to mean for you? Well, that's going to mean the enemy cavalry can't really approach you from different angles. You can shut down that approach. And since they're crossbow units, they have the capability of dishing out massive armor piercing damage. So even if they bring heavy shot cavalry, you can annihilate them at very decent range. They do have slightly lower ammo compared to most crossbow units, especially at this price range. But the damage they dish out is significant enough that I think it makes up for it. It also helps that they have decent morale plus decent melee capabilities in terms of their damage and their defensive stat with the shield. So that makes them quite nice. Their main issue is going to be that if the enemy cavalry commit to charging you, then you're going to be dead because unlike their spear cousin, their square doesn't mean very much because they're not brace spears. So the cavalry can feel good charging right into you while taking a few volleys from your damage. But aside from that, they're great answers into cutting out flanks for enemy cavalry to really approach your army. Of course, generals could still charge you and since your square doesn't really have the brace spear component, they can come in and wreck you as well, uh, unlike their spear cousins. And then we have the Tiger Slinger. So obviously most of this damage is going to be on the Tiger. The problem is the charge has been nerfed. It's only 124 now, barely anything. The melee component of this unit is decent. The range component is sort of a stronger Slinger. But the problem here is Tigers are uncontrollable and a bit fragile. And all the enemy has to do is charge at these Slingers after you release your Tigers. And there's only 30 of them. And once they kill this, the unit's considered dead. So with their relative high cost of 770 and low health, I don't really consider these units viable in multiplayer. Uh, if Tigers still had 500 charge, they would be a lot better, but they don't. It's been nerfed down to 124. So quite significant, and I don't think these are viable anymore. Then we have the E Marksman. So this is the upgraded version of the e Archer. You get more health, more defensive stats, and more morale. You're getting the same exact bow for much higher cost, actually, because E-Archers are 450, E-Marksmen are 800. 
So that puts this unit behind in terms of the value proposition of what you get, because you mainly want these for the range damage. You don't want these for throwing them in melee. So getting the extra armor and extra morale doesn't really help you that much for this much extra cost. Then as we continue to move up in cost, we have 850 to 900, starting with the 850 Black Mountain Hunters. These are available only on Zhangyan, of course. They have Scare. Uh, that's their main selling point. But as a range unit, I don't think you're proccing that too much. Uh, you do have decent amount of range damage, but it's the same as Archer. And at this cost level, you're basically paying for an axe unit with 127 charge, but sadly only 30 morale. And the damage is also quite low, even though most of it is armor piercing with the axe. It's just a weak unit overall. Whether you want to look at the melee component or the range component, it's pretty much an uh, axe band being squished together with an Archer at 850 cost. I don't really think this unit is good at all at this cost level. Then also in the 850 cost, we have the Hidden Vipers. This is the Nama Invisible Poison Dart unit. Now their strength is that they have stock, so you can move them into a proper position and shoot your darts. You probably only will get one or two shots before the enemy realize where you are and they will charge at you. But at that point, you can actually fight back a little bit. You have decent morale, you have okay charge, your damage is mostly base, so that's a bit sad, but you have good defensive stat. You have pretty high evasion with a shield, 52% total. 31% armor, and most deceiving is they actually have 72k health. They actually match the health of regular infantry units. So for green units, purple units, the standard health for 120 unit is 72k. For range unit, it's a lot lower, 40k, 45k, 49k. And surprisingly, the Hidden Viper is the first unit with 72k, so that gives them a bit more advantage. So you can probably consider them as sort of a hybrid infantry unit with some poison capabilities and much more fighting capabilities compared to all the other units here. Then moving on to the Onyx Dragon, which is the longest range archer unit in the game at 250. Their main problem is their base damage, 48 and 9. So most of the damage on base, if you're fighting more elite infantry in the game at, you know, 53% armor, you're only going to be doing about 23, 24 damage from the base. And then plus 9, you're talking about 32 damage overall. It's not very high, and that's a problem. And you don't really want to be paying this much for Archer unit just for their melee stats, which they do have a high amount of, and with a decent amount of morale and high melee evasion, they can last a while if they do get collapsed on, but you're not paying them to do 1914 damage. You can pay melee infantry to do that. You want these units to get their shots in, but unfortunately their shots might not hurt, and that's a problem. Then we have the Thunder of Jian'an. So this is essentially the same Fury of Beihai. That costs 50% more, 600 cost, 900 cost, and all you're getting is a bit more morale, I think a little bit more health, and perhaps a little bit more armor. It's not really a good trade. Just stick with Fury of Beihai. Save yourself some money. Then we have Chen Royal Guard at 900. Now this is a very different unit. So this unit has extremely high armor. They also carry a big shield, so they give even more armor stats. 70% armor, 32% invasion. Their melee damage is that of a spear guard, since they also carry a shield, 7, 23, 20 attack rate, that's exactly like a spear guard. Decent enough morale at 43, and decent enough range damage with the standard crossbow damage of 220 range, 18, 42. And these are going to be great frontline crossbow options because they can do very well in melee. And they also have the mix formation where you can have a frontline of spear with the rest of the unit shooting behind to protect them at least from a frontal assault. Um, if they had square, it would be even better, but they don't. Uh, these still count mainly as range units, even though they do have the spear weapon. But overall, at this price, you're just getting a premium infantry unit that is a spear guard with a very strong crossbow. The only thing that's limiting it from viability is really the lack of a square formation. If they have that, this would be a god tier unit. But because they don't have that and the price is quite high, I would say this is just a usable unit in multiplayer. You also have to use Liu Chong, but Liu Chong is actually very strong with Show of Force, so that's not really a hindrance. It's just that he's so strong with Show of Force that I actually banned him in our tournament, so you might not actually get to use these units because of that. Uh, because the general is so strong, maybe it's going to be banned in a lot of games. Then moving on to the premium end of range infantries, we have the 1,000 to 1,200 cost, and starting things off, we have the Archer Masters at 1,000. These are available to Yellow Turban DLC scholars, so He Man and Huang Shao. And they are basically the 225 range from Man of the Forest, but I think they're worse because Man of the Forest actually has an axe and decent damage. 
The archer masters have the same damage as archer militias with higher morale. So basically it takes them slightly longer to route, but once you get a unit on top of them, they're basically dead. So for 1000 cost, they're absolutely horrible. Then for defenders of earth, these are quarter size units. You're only gonna get 30 of them. They do have oil arrows. It does hurt a lot. The trick is how do you get the enemy units to stand still to get hit by your oil arrows at 150 range? If you have a way to do that, then they will dish out a ton of damage. And they're also really good in the rain as we have seen in our siege battle from round two, they destroy towers really quick. So if you do have a siege battle, they're a great option for wiping out towers and burning the town, regardless of the weather condition. But in terms of unit, they're hard to protect, even though they have high defense, there's only so few of them. Um, so even with the high melee stats, they're not really gonna do much. And you can see the health is being punished. 22K is actually not low, because remember, they're quarter size. If you multiply them by four, it's actually 88K health as a regular unit, which is actually super high, uh, highest in the game. So per unit health is very high on these units. Um, but when I say highest in the game, I mean for range units. You can't compare them to per unit health of elephants, for example, that's not fair. Um, they have also really good morale, but overall it's more about how to find a situation where your enemies are clustered for your oil arrows to do damage. If you have a way to guarantee that, then of course this is a great option. Then we have Imperial Palace Crossbowmen. Now this is going to be your premium high-end crossbow units, 20, 45 damage, 250 range. They also will get the solidarity bonus, but I'm not even showing it here because it's not relevant. You don't need extra base damage. You don't need extra morale. You don't need extra evasion for your range unit. Uh, you just want to protect them. And that's the thing. How do you protect these units? Um, if they get run in by a general who does some sort of flame the Phoenix, you will lose half of your units here. There's nothing you can do about that. So they have the same weakness as all range infantry in that how do you keep them safe so they can shoot their damage? You need to have a way to take out enemy generals. If you do have that, and there are certain composition strategies where you can use to lock down enemy generals with different immobilize and try to kill them before they reach your formation. But if you don't have that put in place, then these units are not really gonna be viable. And then my argument is, if you have a pretty nice way of killing enemy generals, then your units doesn't have to be ranged units either. Like the main benefit of range infantry in the campaign and why they're so valuable is you're trading ammo for casualties. You're getting free kills that's not being traded back. So you end up with a fight that's much cleaner. You don't take casualties. You don't have to waste time getting replenished and thus makes the campaign a lot smoother. In multiplayer, casualty doesn't matter. If you end the battle with only one unit, you still won. In the next battle, you'll set up a new army and they'll be all ready. So that's why range units lose a lot of value in multiplayer, because you want to trade value for value. And if you can't get all your ammo to go out because they can get on top of you, then you lose everything you paid that unit for. Whereas if you get a melee unit, the only way they can kind of kill you is throw themselves into melee and you can guarantee a dish back some damage. So that's where the value proposition between a campaign battle and a multiplayer battle changes quite significantly, especially for range infantry. So now that we looked at all the range infantry, let's look at the other two types, starting with the siege weapons. There are three of them. They all cost 1060, so quite pricey, and they're the trebuchet multiple crossbow and juggernaut. We can talk about them together. And that's because they're all really bad for multiplayer because they're really slow. It does say 38 speed, but that's kind of the infantry speed. The machines are slower. They turn very slowly. If the enemy really deploy behind you from your side, just turning these, you eliminate the possibility of shooting these. And if you're playing against a patient player or a smart player who see that you have them and you're facing the army with them, then they're not gonna charge directly at you. They will shift their army to the side, force you to maneuver your uh, siege weapons to go with it. They can stay out of range, try to run a general up to trick your unit to fire off their ammo or to uh, just charge straight for them, wiping them out like a uh, range infantry. So overall, you're committing a ton of resources on something that's not really gonna work. This is not against AI. They're not gonna clump up their units and charge at your siege weapons and your siege weapons gonna get what, 200, 300 kills on campaign. And plus all the ones you're getting are rank one. You have to commit a lot more money 
to rank them up for accuracy. And that's just not worth it in multiplayer. Juggernaut is a little bit more interesting because I have seen a couple player try a certain strategy where they get the immobilize, whether from Liu Zhang or Diao Chan or Lu Bu on enemy units or on enemy uh, officers. So imagine you have this as a bait, right? You have the Juggernaut in your formation. The enemy units are coming at you, their cavalry kind of flanking you, and then you hit them with the immobilize. And then in the next couple of seconds, you get your Juggernauts, you blow fire on them and they die. It could work. I had that done to me firsthand, but even in that case, I didn't end up losing the battle because it's the case of like, fool me once, shame on me, right? Uh, so like once you see it happen once, you know how to not approach it like that. And for units like Juggernauts with very low range, uh, you can use some, you know, cavalry archer, kite them out, uh, or just stay away from them. They can't really chase you. So just fight in the other places. If they're just trying to protect one siege weapon, their entire composition is going to be very static. They're going to try to keep all the units together. And that's usually a very weak thing in multiplayer when you can't really protect all the angles correctly. It just takes way too much commitment of cost to protect these units and also to use the right generals to keep them safe to make them worth it. Like you're ending up paying at least a couple more spearmen in terms of cost just to stand next to these units in the hopes that they can hit the enemy units with a few volleys. So I just think siege weapons are just basically not viable in multiplayer. Then finally, we have the range cavalry. And there's a couple of these from different costs. We're going to start from the lowest to the highest again, starting with the 400 to 670 costs. Uh, these are much more interesting units and much more viable due to their high mobility because you don't have to protect them. You can use them to kite the enemy around. You can harass them. You can put fire arrows on key units. And for some of the more premium varieties, you can even use them as cavalry and charge them, given that they have high enough melee charge bonus. But starting at the low end, we have the Horseback Huntsman. This is available on the Yellow Turban DLC Veterans. And their main strength is they're super cheap. At 400 cost, this is really, really cheap units. We're talking about militia tier cost for a unit that has 200 range with the 4010 bow damage. Decent amount of ammo. You have to divide all the ammo belt four to get the relative total damage output that you would get on a regular range infantry. But still, very impressive damage. Of course, as a cavalry unit, there's not a lot of value because there's almost no charge, there's almost no damage. But as a harassment unit at low cost, it is quite nice for just a bit of fire arrow damage or a bit of poison arrow damage. And they also have very high speed. So that's their strength here. Then for mounted archers, this is more of the standard one for all Vanguard generals, which is a bit shocking. Um, they have much less damage, actually. They have more of the archer damage at 25 and 8. 200 range, they still don't have the charge capability that will make them useful as a cavalry unit, and they're a lot slower. They cost a bit more than the horseback huntsmen, so the difference here is pretty clear. Night and day, 400 cost for higher bow damage, higher speed, more harassment-based uh, range cavalry, versus a 550 cost that's sort of slower, much less damage, still can't really charge type of unit. Then we have the Xianbei horse archers. Now, these are only available on Sima Yun in multiplayer, so that's one restriction. They're pretty much the mounted archers if you look at it. There is really no difference if you want to nitpick. If anything, they have less morale. So they're clearly worse, and you end up with 600 costs instead of 550 costs. Um, so I don't know really why these units should even be considered. Then we have mounted crossbowmen. Uh, these are going to use a different type of bow, of course, with a crossbow, higher range, and thus higher armor piercing makes them a bit better. But their issue is, once again, you're paying a lot for a unit that cannot really also work as a charging unit due to their low melee charge bonus and low damage. So that's going to restrict them quite a bit, and their speed is also not top tier either. Then moving to the 700 to 750 costs, we have the heavy mounted archer, so a more defensive variant of the mounted archers with even slower speed thanks to their higher armor. Their charge bonus is getting up there, but it's still not very high. The bow damage is still that alpha archer, so with a low morale, it's not really a viable unit. But moving up in cost by a little bit, 720, we have the northern mounted archer. And now we finally have an archer unit that has decent enough charge damage, and not only that, the damage variety split is that of a short spear, 723 with the 20 attack speed. It's the most familiar damage setup in the game. Basically, it's the spear guard setup. So that makes them slightly better, and that also means they have bonus against large. 
and their defense stats better, their morale is at 40. So this becomes probably the first uh, viable, slightly more expensive range cavalry unit in the game. Then moving up, we also have the Town Hunters for slightly more. They have pretty much the same charge damage as what we saw with the Northern Mounted Archers, but their melee damage is actually a bit worse. They use a Glaive with a slower attack rate, but higher base damage. They have similar defensive stats, I would argue, uh, without the shield, of course. And then we have much higher arrow damage. That's their strength. They have the Onyx Dragon Bow, 250 range, 48 nine, and 50 ammo. So they're going to have great range damage. They have fatigue immunity. They can kite you out forever. So you can use them to run in circles around the enemy. The longer the battle goes, the better they are because they will always be fresh while the enemy will get tired and tired and you have a chance to continue your harassment with the right fire arrows at the right place to hurt their morale and to find flanks. And then if you have to use them as a melee cav, they can do decently well. The glaive that they use do have bonus against cavalry, but it's just not as high as the spear. I think it's plus five instead of plus seven for the short spear. But overall, still a very good unit. Then moving on to the premium men at 800 to 110, we have the Northern Mounted Raiders. This is the Yuan Shao variety of the Northern units. The other one we saw earlier was Tall Tall's Factions variety. And this is actually a lot better because we finally have a unit that breaks 200 melee charge. So they're a very respectable shock cavalry type of melee charge bonus with very good damage, 23, 23, 20 attack rate. So it's more of the Z damage. So I think it's a plus seven against large as well. Defensively, no shield, but that's fine. Uh, you have 200 range. Archer damage is a little bit disappointing, but overall, because the melee component, it does make up for it. Then we have the White Horse Raiders. This is Gong Sun Zan's unique unit. Uh, it has 850 cost. We're looking at 211 charge once again. The melee component is much worse. I think they use a sword, so that's a little bit worse. But their range component is better. 200 range, 40, 10 damage. So we're using the more premium bow. And their key strength is that they're faster at 95 speed. And then finally, once we break 1,000 at 1,100, we have the Imperial Palace Cavalry. These are actually really good because there are 60 units in this group. And that means you have more people shooting these arrow damage. So they're only half the size. So their total damage potential just went way up compared to all the units we've seen here. They have the 220 range crossbow with the 1842 damage. It's very nice. If you properly kite these guys, uh, they can do fairly well. We're not showing the Imperial bonus again here because it's not really relevant. But the plus 10 you know, armor piercing melee damage can make them better, right? 30 attack rate, 2318. It's a lot better than 238. And the higher morale and the evasion makes them capable fighters if they do get in trouble in terms of getting caught up by enemy cavalry, but you don't really want that situation. You want them to keep kiting, dish out their damage, protect them with just a little bit of spear nearby. You don't really need to actually put a spear, you know, on top of them all the time. You can just kite them back towards the spear. Even if you're slower, as long as you can get close to your spear in time, the enemy cavalry will probably shy away from charging at you because those spears can get on top of the enemy cavalry and help you peel off, and then you can kill off those cavalry pretty easily. So overall, this is a very powerful unit. And speaking of powerful unit, also at 1100 cost, we have the White Horse Fellow. This is not the typical light heavy upgrade. They're actually significantly better in terms of damage because they're using a much better bow. They're using the Onyx Dragon Bow. So we're having the 48 nine damage output at 250 range. You have very good charge. You have the same weapon damage as the White Horse Raider. That part is a little bit more disappointing. And because you got a little bit more armor, you're actually a little bit slower, which is also a bit sad. Um, but overall, these are all pretty viable units for multiplayer due to their high mobility. So you don't actually have to protect them with a unit and they can dish out damage as well as fire arrows to harass the enemy morale, which is also a very key point for multiplayer battles. So that's going to do it for our overview. We're going to jump back over and do our tier list ranking. Alrighty, so we're going to be ranking these from the highest tier to the lowest tier because many of these units are going to be not really viable in multiplayer, uh, which is sadly the case for most range units. Uh, it goes against my being because I really love range units, but they're just really not good in multiplayer because as we mentioned, the value proposition you're paying for is totally different. You don't care about casualties in multiplayer, and that's really what makes range unit a lot weaker. So starting things off with the S tier, there's only one unit I can think of that belongs in the S tier, and that's the Imperial Palace Cavalry. 
And the reason why they deserve this ranking is because they're double size. They're decent enough in melee because of their solidarity bonus with another Imperial unit nearby. They have decent enough speed. They have very high damage output with the crossbow damage set and decent enough range. And they can function as a cavalry unit afterward as well. That's double size as well. So there's a lot of pros for this unit. It does cost a lot, but that's fine because multiplayer is about paying for more elite units and using them well. So they definitely fit the bill as the S tier. And unfortunately, they're going to be the only S tier. Um, there's just really not any other unit I think is worth it uh, in multiplayer from the range or the blue units here. Then kicking off the A tier, we have the Horseback Huntsman from the Yellow Turban. Uh, these are available on the Yellow Turban DLC veterans, so Gongdu, Pei Wenshao, Zhang Kai. And it's useful because it's extremely cheap. You're getting fairly good value from a range horseback unit. That's really what it is. It shoots the right arrows. It has good range damage. I think it's the 40 uh, variety instead of the 25 for the base damage. So it's a better bow and it's just extremely cheap. For the cost of the Imperial Palace Cavalry, you can get three of these. And that's what makes this extremely valuable for multiplayer. And that's why it's going to be A tier. Then we have more premium options as well at 800 cost or double cost. We have the Northern Mounted Raiders. So this is one of those range cavalry units with over 200 charge bonus. Very good damage composition in terms of the weapon as well. Defensively, a little bit weaker. And the range component is also a little bit weaker with only the 25 damage bow. But you might just want to use them for harassment with fire arrows and then charge in and actually do cavalry damage, which they're very good at. And since they're available for advantage loss factor only, things like Distant Courage that boost extra charge can actually give them over 300 melee charge bonus. Uh, makes them quite scary, actually, as a cavalry unit. Then also making tier A, we have the White Horse Raiders, the cheaper variety of Gong Sun Zan's unit. Uh, these are decent value for their range damage at the 40 tier. And they have the 211 charge. And because the price difference, I think they have a pretty good value proposition here. And because the higher charge, making them a dual threat with both the cavalry and the bow, they're going to also join the A tier. And then that also means the more premium version, the White Horse Fellows, will also hit this tier because they get a better bow at the higher price, of course. But they have the Onyx Dragon Bow with a higher range and even higher charge bonus. So even though it's only by a little bit. So we're going to consider them the same tier as the White Horse Raiders. And also there's the interesting phenomenon in game where for different tier generals, you actually get access to the White Horse Fellows at tier one and the White Horse Raiders at tier two because the price uh, was incorrect for the campaign and they fixed it in the last patch, but they didn't fix it for multiplayer, uh, which is also a little bit interesting. But overall, I think they're rated the same. Then continuing the trend of cavalry horseback archers making the list, we have the Tian Hunters being a B-tier unit. Now, I know Fatigue Immunity sounds great, but uh, it only has value if the battle goes late. And for most multiplayer battles, I don't know how late it usually goes, but uh, if you find yourself with only Tian Hunters at the end game, maybe that's not a great thing either. But overall, they're still an excellent unit. They're a little bit slower compared to many of their counterparts. They don't have as much charge, uh, but they are still an excellent unit for their bow component. I'm going to rate them just slightly lower because they have much less charge bonus. They're only at the 100 tier and they have much slower attack rate with their weapon. They're only 19 attack speed here. So they're going to just drop a tad lower and joining them in the B tier. We're finally going to give some love to Archer Infantries, and that's going to be the White Tiger Raiders. Uh, the reason why they get picked is they cost 460, very cheap. They can be recruited on Yan Baihu, which gives them stock. And because they have the spear formation of a shield wall, they can dismount generals, they can trap enemy cavalry that gets up close, and with the range capability as well to shoot fire arrows and poison arrows, makes them quite a flexible, versatile unit. That's why they're the first infantry uh, range unit that makes the list here. Then moving down to tier C, we can add a couple more of these infantry types with the peasant archer. And the reason why they can make the list is at 145 cost is just dirt cheap. You got an expendable unit that can shoot fire arrows. Can't really complain about their value proposition here. Then also joining them is going to be the fire archers. This is actually just a very interesting unit in terms of their damage. They actually have high damage for the fire arrow plus the fire damage on top. 
Uh, they don't cost the cheapest at 500 and they don't have you know good melee stats or good morale but just because the high range damage that they can have on their fire arrows i think it gives them a viable chance to be used in multiplayer then joining right behind them we have the fury of Beihai. so this is going to be your top end crossbow units with a 250 range only cost 600 to recruit very very good value I would not consider the upgraded version Thunder of Jian. It just gives a little bit more armor stats, a little bit more health, and slightly more morale. I would just stick with these guys. They have decent enough morale already. You don't really want them in melee. You want to try to protect them and dish out their high range damage here. Then joining them, we also have Watcher of the Peace, which is a crossbow unit as well. A little less damage with 220 range with the 1842 split instead of the 2045 split about 10 percent difference but overall their strength is that they have a shield and they're a yellow turban variety so if you're playing as a yellow turban unit this is the one you want to go with the shield helps you against other range cavalry in essence because if you're staying there trying to trade fire with range cavalry which is really the only unit you want to trade fire with i mean there's no way the enemy will march up their infantry to trade fire with you at least i hope not that's a weird situation to be in uh, one player is just misplaying that situation if you find yourself in that situation usually it's just the enemies harassing you with their cavalry and you want to return the harassment fire with these and they can do fairly well you know marching into the enemy cavalry range and then trading fire with them so you're actively seeking out that trade in that situation then continue the trend with 600 cost unit because Fury of Beihai, Watchmen of the Peace have all been 600. We also have the Javelin Throwers. So this is going to be sort of your shield unit. They already have a default shield and spear. Uh, they just can throw the spear and have more spear to throw. They have basically six ammos a very, very high armor piercing damage at short range. They have access to formations like the shield wall. That's going to give them a lot of extra points here. They also can use circle formation. Uh, to get 360 degrees although 360 degree defense range with only 60 range is not really that valuable but it's still a very very nice unit because of that so at this low cost for the naman troop option i think they're great uh, counters to enemy cavalry great counters to enemy generals and they can definitely be included in your army and also with the similar thought of having 360 degree defense the Ye vanguard crossbowmen will also join this list as they also have access to square the only thing is their secondary weapon is not a spear, so they can't really brace themselves in the square. So if you get charged on, you will still take a lot of damage, but they're a great option to shut down flanking angles for enemy cavalry, and that's where their real value lies. And they still have a very decent range attack if you need them in a regular format where the enemy don't have any ways of approaching you. 220 range, 1842 damage, very respectable for what they bring to the battlefield. Then also joining this group, we have the Hidden Vipers. Uh, they cost a bit more, 850, but they are stock, so you can sneak up on enemies, get a couple of good volleys to apply poison. And then once you get into melee, you're actually pretty decent because you're one of the few range units or range infantry units with 72k health. So that's their main strength, is that they are decent in melee once you apply poison to a target that you want to fight. So you can always find the right targets, and once you find them, you can have a good chance of beating them. And speaking of being good in melee, we can't forget the Chen Royal Guards. These guys are just the premium infantry variety here with the amount of armor they bring. And they have decent enough attack, and their crossbow damage is definitely respectable with a 220 range type of crossbow that they bring. They have a few formations, the mixed missile formation. It's not the best, but it will serve its purpose. And since its weapon is a spear variety, if the enemy do run into your mixed missile, you can dismount them because the front line are basically spear guard units. And then joining them, we also have the other very heavily armored uh, crossbow unit here with the Imperial crossbow units. Um, they have a very similar situation. They have a very good crossbow, very good armor, can do fairly well in melee because of the solidarity bonus with the flat 10 point boost to armor piercing. That's going to help them a lot. And then also tagging along with all these infantry, we're going to throw the Northern uh, Mounted Archer in here. They're cheaper, they have good value proposition. They're not as good as the Raider variety in terms of charge bonus, but they're still very serviceable. So I would still consider them uh, as a viable choice here for a multiplayer with a C rank, as every other unit down below are gonna get the D rank. So I would not recruit these as I don't think they will help you in multiplayer. So we're gonna just slot everyone in here. And that's really gonna do it for our tier list. 
And as I explained earlier, a lot of this is based on reasons that you can't really protect these units, uh, or you have to spend you know way too much resource to try to protect these units when you could just spend the money on other units uh, that can bring back more even trade for the value that you have to pay to recruit them. Uh, at the end of the day, it's a value proposition game as both armies are limited by their army fund and range units just really doesn't bring that value back, which is why we only have one S tier unit and most of the units shift down closer to C and D tier. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this tier list. And as always, let me know in the comment section below if you agree or disagree with some of these choices, or perhaps you have a very interesting way of using one of these units. As we mentioned earlier, I have seen people try to use immobility plus the juggernauts. It's actually very cool to see, but I still think it's very uh, sort of special occasion only. It doesn't really give the unit you know, a worthy high rank. So regardless, um, let me know how you feel about the tier list, and we'll see you guys in the next one as we move on to the red unit or the shock cavalry next time. So until then, bye.